Hi, welcome to Transform Life Church. In a few moments, we'll be joining the service already in progress. If you're joining us for the first time, I'm glad that you're here with us. I pray that today's message will be a great blessing to you. So don't go anywhere. I'll be back in a moment to share some next steps with you. Hallelujah. So when you see him, you will recognize that we, his ambassador comes to us all the time. And he's really an honorary TLC member. And, and we'll soon get his Jamaican citizenship. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> um, we just welcome Pastor Kwame. Now, he has recently, I think, received the highest award um, in, from his country. And we are delighted to have him. Let's give him a big round of applause. Before he comes, one of his disciples is going to minister to us. And he is Minister Dingwell. And let's welcome him as he comes. I know 
He really loves me. This is my soul. This is my story. This is my soul. Hey, she do did 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 do did 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 Having church, we had reggae and then we had jazz. Amen. In the presence of the Lord. And don't look so serious. It was gospel jazz. Amen. But I'm thrilled to be here in Jamaica. God is here this morning. Amen. His presence is promised to us where two or three are gathered. He's in the midst to bless. But I'm not only praising God for his presence, but I thank God that in Jamaica I have many friends and I saw them coming out to give me good support. So don't try to take advantage of me in Jamaica because I have plenty of friends here. Amen. Bruce and Patsy Fletcher, would they stand please? They are long-standing friends. Michael Jones, would you stand please? Richard Delessa, my good friend. Hallelujah. I want you to know I'm a kingdom person. I'm not done yet, but Richard is working on that project in the 72 acres. In, in, so I'm a kingdom person. He's a good friend, and I thank God for him. When I came, I called him. He was not well, and I saw him this morning. I said revival and resurrection took place. Amen. Okay, then we have Michelle Bowley. Michelle is part of our family. Michelle, would you stand up, please? Thank you. Amen. All right, I hope I'm not missing. Donovan Thomas was here. Um, he just left. He told me he spoke at our church. And I have to love Jamaica because my daughter-in-law is from Jamaica. I don't know if her dad is here, but he's supposed to be here this morning. Is he here? Dave, um, David, just wave your hands. I'm glad you came. I'll see you after the service, but... We are very, very happy to be here. And most of all, my wife of 45 years is with me here. I want to stand, please. She's the wife of my youth. Amen. And I'm very happy. Yesterday I looked at her and I said, you are such a wonderful, beautiful woman. You know, I looked at her and she said, do you have something in mind? But I was saying that in front of Michael. I, I really thank God for her. I could not pastor a church as, as large as that and with so many issues and uh, uh, dealing with people unless I had good support and strong support at home. Amen? All right, and I'm very, very happy again to be here. I was, I'm well treated. Um, great hospitality. And uh, I want to get into God's word now, but... Before I do, I want to congratulate you on your anniversary, seventh anniversary. And I, you know, I am not the inspector of churches. I have been pastoring a long time, 11 years as a youth pastor and 34 years as a senior pastor and in one place. But I have friends all over. I travel all over. The picture you saw is a picture of me speaking in Holland. And Jesus was an evaluator of the church. If you just look through the book of Revelation, he went through church by church, and he pointed out all the wonderful things, and he told them about the things that they needed to correct. But I'm here probably as an encourager, a supporter, and I am fully well, I'm cognizant of the, the things that really make for a great church. And I want to tell you some things that I observed in this church. My theme is don't lose it. 
And I want to tell you some things that I've observed about Pastor Dwight and his wonderful group of people. And just for two or three days I've been here, but I've observed so many things. You are a growing church. And you ought to thank God that you are growing because many churches are dead. Nothing is happening. And here I heard, I wrote down, 245 per persons were baptized. You run three services in seven years, and that's very commendable. The average church all over the world is about 60 persons. And for you to reach this number, well, I think that you have done very well. And by the way, Jesus, he compliments growth. He wants fruit, more fruit, much fruit. And when we have much fruit, he says, so we are his disciples. As a matter of fact, we are chosen for fruit bearing. And I want you also to know the nature of the kingdom is about expansion and growth. You were given the Bible for multiplication. So I want to compliment you for a growing church. Let's put our hands together for that. <laughs> Secondly, you are a passionate church. I noticed that. Energy here, man. Wow. You are a worshiping church. And you know, worship really demonstrates your love for God. If you love him, you will worship him. And when I see passion like this, it has to come out from what I call wholeheartedness. Or what I call commitment, like Caleb. Caleb was a man who was wholehearted. He said, I, 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 I carry the report as it was in my heart. And I followed what the Lord said. I wholly followed the Lord. Wherever you see wholeheartedness, you know you can exchange that word for commitment. And wherever you see commitment, you will see passion. And I believe that there is a level of commitment and worship and that's why we see that this church is a passionate church, not only a growing church. So, put your hands together for a passionate church. Keep it up, Pastor. Don't lose it. This church is a happy church. Now, who wants to go to a dead place when the world is sad? When your world, our world really, you know, puts you down, you want to go to a place that will lift you up, encourage you, lift your spirit, turn your morning into dancing. And you know, I met the staff, and the staff is a reflection of the congregation because it's, if it starts with the leaders, then the followers will be the same. And I found lots of people are very happy, outgoing, smiling. There's no reason for us to be sad. You know, when the, the Queen of Sheba went to, when she went to Solomon, and she noticed all the powerful things about the church, she saw food on the table. She saw order. She saw ministry and service. She saw the way the people dressed, their deportment. And she said, the lady collapsed. You know, she said, half has not been told. And she, she, she fainted. And she said to Solomon, happy are the people around you. In the book of 1 Kings. Happy are those who hear your wisdom. And I suppose people are hearing wisdom. And they are under an empowering leader. People don't be happy under despots. They are rigid. So I want to thank God for a church that is a happy church. It's going to attract people as it is doing. Let's put our hands together for that. I made mention it's an empowering church because there is a kind of leadership that really attracts people. The heart of leadership must really be to empower, not to control. Your congregation can grow exponentially if you are an empowering leader and not a controlling leader. That's why God said to Pharaoh through Moses, go tell that man, let my people go. 
set them free that they may serve me. And I want you to know as a congregation, you are free. But not free to do what you want, but free to serve God with your freedom. So let's thank God for empowering church. Come on, clap your hands. This is your, come on, some energy. Amen. Some good things are happening. This church is a hospitable church. If the heart of this church is like Vaughn, who is taking us around. Vaughn, would you stand, please? Vaughn, where are you? Where is he? Vaughn, where are you? Vaughn is a very kind man. He showed us his beautiful, he showed off with his beautiful wife. I saw us singing on the platform here. He's very kind. Pastor, you put a good man to take care of us. And I wish that everybody will be like Vaughn. Tell somebody I wish everybody's like Vaughn. Please. He is very hospitable. Watch me. It's very important for, I want you to understand at the very heart of this is something that Jesus taught us. People matter to God. People are very important. People must have high value. And wherever, you see, I think about it. When I went to the church and I got saved and God touched my life by his grace, if I had been to a place that rejected me or a place that looked down upon me and a place that never valued me, I would never be what I want to be today. I want you to know that when people are coming from the world, they are coming from a hostile world. And as a church, we must never forget. And our final apologetic is that we must love one another. And we must accept people because institutions don't accept people. They reject people. And if there is a, the only place that must accept people and help people and love people and understand people matter to God is the church of Jesus Christ. So I thank God for a hospitable church. Then very briefly, it's already a missionary church. They have the full mission a full-time missionary. That's good. And I believe the missionary is a pastor's son. Your first son. The first one. You have more missionaries? That's good. You know why? Because a healthy church is a church that intakes and outflow. The church in Thessalonica, they received the word in much affliction, but from them sounded out of the gospel. If you receive, you must give out. That's a healthy church and a healthy person. So this church is a missionary church. Then this church is a united church. All of this I observed. They may not have it 100%, but I observed. They have the marks of it. Seven years. And I'm, I'm, I'm saying to them, don't lose it. I know what I'm saying. Because churches lose it. And the moment you lose it, you will die. Churches die. Institutions die. So I'm saying to you, don't lose it. Keep your pizzazz. Keep your fizz. Keep your excitement. And by the way, excitement is not something that can be pretended. If, you're not, if you don't have a vision and you don't have a goal and you don't have a vision, a vision is something that really drives morale. You can't pretend it. This church is a united church. I saw the staff working together, and they, I love the office, Pastor. It's contemporary. Your office where you work. I saw the values written on the, on, on the walls. I said, saw them working in clusters. They're a happy bunch. I told them tomorrow I want to come and talk to the staff. I came to do some work. So you're a united, united church. Unity drives impact. The more united you are, the more you can achieve a united church. Let's put our hands together for a united church. And by the way, when I started pastoring, I started pastoring from a crisis. Our church had what you call a big split. It was the ugliest thing that I ever went through. Don't, don't ask God Please, that the church stay established and united and together because this unity is ugly. 
I saw people want to fight in the church. Imagine, please. Church people want to fight. I saw people jump over pews like if they were in the, in the Olympics. I saw people screaming like if they were in Papine Market. In the market, I went to the market. I, when I go to a place, I like to go to the market. I like to the grocery. I want to see the people. I want to read the papers. I want to experience the culture. And by the way, you're a great nation, a nation of brands. You don't know that. Jamaica is a strong place. I admire it. The athletic brand, the reggae brand, the Blue Mountain Coffee brand, the jerk chicken brand. Come on, give, your, give, yourself, a, give yourself some praise. Very quickly, don't lose it. Don't lose it. Tell somebody, don't lose it. This church is a relevant church. All that I observed. And relevance is important. Some churches are back in the 50s. The music in the 50s. The dresses in the 50s. I like to hang out with young people, you know. I'm telling you one time. I just dressed touche this morning. And with a tie and so on. But I really like to hang out with young people. I carry them on our trips, etc. They feel very comfortable with me. But I like the relevance of the church. I like that you're, you're into technology. You know, I like, I like the people who get up and they give the announcements, man. They are polished. Come on, put your hands together, man. You have, you have a good thing going. And then, I know, definitely, there is a value here. A strong value of excellence. See, you didn't know what you have. It takes somebody from the outside to come and tell you what you have. And I'm not flattering you. I don't flatter people. God has given us a passage of scripture in Isaiah 60 and verse 15. It says we shall be an eternal excellence, a joy of many generations. When there is excellence, you attract. Quality attracts quantity. You have to keep the standard high. The church in the last day, the mountain of the house of the Lord, shall be established on the mountain and exalted above the hill. The church should be a cut above the rest. And then the people shall flow into it. I take these principles practically and apply it to my church. And by the way, I've asked my congregation, why do they tolerate a pastor for 35 years? After 35 years, people would want to get rid of a leader. I want to tell you something. When you, you must know why you're winning. That's why I say don't lose it. If you know why you are winning and you reinforce it, you will keep winning. And I think that's the reason why they have me around. All of this couldn't happen without good, strong, vibrant, youthful, passionate leadership. Let's put our hands together for Pastor Dwight and his wife. Stand up, please. Stand up, sir. Stand up. Don't be bashful, you and your dear wife. Let's put our hands together for leaders. Amen. Thank God for him. Thank God for him. Nothing, nothing, nothing worthwhile happens without a dream and without a dreamer. Nothing worthwhile happens without a dream and a dreamer. I heard somebody, that's why God sent leadership. He sent leaders to solve problems. He told me that. A leader can make a difference. The leader studied the history of Singapore. is one man who stayed there for years and established the values and the foundation and probably has been there for probably three and more decades. God has taught me that. Leader. Leaders are important. Respect him. God sent a man, Psalm 105, verse 17, before them. God always sends a man. People are pitied if they don't have leaders. Jesus saw people as sheep without shepherds, and he wanted to cry for them. So when you have a good leader, pray for him. He's not perfect. I'm not sure. He, I'm sure he's not perfect. Just like me, I'm not perfect. But pray for your leader. Thank God for him. If God, yes, come on, that's right. 
So I'm saying you are a growing church, a passionate church, a happy church, an empowering church, a hospitable church, a missionary church, a united church, a relevant church, and all of this is happening through good leadership. And that's why you should do your very best to preserve it, fight for it, fight to maintain it and fight to keep it. And by the way, I want you to know that you are a witness to others. There was a man who, probably a middle class man back home, and he's got into business and he's doing very, very well. And one friend was telling me how some people, the, the, the richer people, came and bought him out. And I said, oh my, why did he do that? Why did he sell out his business? He didn't only sell out his business, but he sold out his influence. He's reaching other people, inspiring other people, and they did not know it. And he did not know it, in fact. So I want you to know that you are inspiring and encouraging others out of your rivers, out of your belly. In fact, rivers of living water are flowing and it's reaching and touching people and you don't know. Now, keep it up. Don't lose it. That's my theme. You know how the Bible says it? Jesus said to one church, I want you to strengthen that which remains. I always told my son, we both played cricket for the island, both myself and Luke, youth cricket. And I told my son, I want you to go and see cricket. Yes, what happened to the match with Red Force? Did Red Force win? Yesterday, nobody knows about cricket. You're not even interested in cricket again. There once upon a time, we were all interested in West Indies cricket. You know, I went to England and a man said, you want to hear a joke? His name is Maldwin Jones. You want to hear a joke? The West Indies cricket team. That's what we came to. Long ago, listen, Wes Hall was my coach. And I asked him, I said, Wes, why it is, one time I went to see test cricket, and I said, where's all, why? Why it is when you bowl a bounce and somebody's on the ground, you and Charlie Griffith used to sit down and never go and empathize with a man. And he told me a story about when Australia used to come in the 50s with Davidson and those people. Those Australians used to knock them down and laugh. So it was revenge time for them. But hear it. Why you have no interest in cricket? There's once a time we walk very proudly. We belong, to the, uh, we belong to the Caribbean and the West Indies team is our team. But no, you don't want to identify with that. We're not winning at all. But here is. When you're winning, you must know why you're winning. If the West Indies team knew why it was winning, then it would reinforce the behavior and they would have been winning today. The other teams imagine Bangladesh. Listen, listen, long ago I went to see cricket. I was 12 years old in the, and I love cricket in the Oval. And men like Nari Contractor in India, that is on top of the roost today, 50 something runs the out and down from, and they're frightened. They're ducking. Look at them today. We lost. So here is a powerful lesson. If you're on top today, it does not mean that you will be on top all the time. And I pray, God, that this church will keep growing and glowing and flowing. Amen. And by the way, let me, let me emphasize this as I continue. Prayer is the fuel. Prayer is the fuel for the growth of the church. I have traveled all around the world. I preached to 9,000 people. As I walked in this morning, I saw the rose and saw the order. And I said, Michael, did you remember South Africa? We preached in a church. 9,000 persons sitting in front of me. And you can be growing and you can be glowing. This is your anniversary. Thank God for where you have reached. Uh, lift your hands and say, great is thy faithfulness. But you, this is not it. We are still climbing. God is taking us on an upward journey. Hallelujah, Pastor Dwight. The journey is upward. Hallelujah. I want you to know that he's not taking us downward, but he's taking us upward. He's moving us from the low places of the earth to the high places of the earth. Give him praise this morning. So don't be like the West Indies team. Know why you're winning. All the things I'm saying, I want you to reinforce it. 
But I want to show you in the Bible that there was a group of people that lost it. The Bible is so very relevant. There was a down, downward spiral in their life. How many of you know? I thank God I'm married 45 years. Bruce, how many years are you married? 36 years. And this is the wife of my youth, and I really thank God. But you know, you, you have to be wise. You have to work on the relationship. You can't be careless. You have to know the rules of relationship. Otherwise, you can't last 45 years. One of the things God has to give you is capacity. Men, right? I assure you. You have to understand your wife, etc. You know, some things you ought to just pass off and leave that. That's not a priority. Don't get vexed with that. Anyhow, what I'm saying, romance can move to rut. And rut can move to regret. And regret can, remove, can move to resentment. And resentment can move to a rift. That does not have to be. But I want you to know that relationships must be maintained. Otherwise, relationships can die. If you don't believe it, go to the first church that Jesus spoke to in Revelation. And he says, you're doing well in everything. But nevertheless, I have one thing against you. You have lost your what? First love, and that's, that's the... You know, Pastor Dwight, I want to tell you something. The reason why you're so excited and the church is what it is, it is that thing that is driving it. That one single thing is love. When you love, you'll just be passionate, you know. When you love, you're passionate. Come on, talk to me. If you're not in love, you lose your passion and pizzazz. Huh? You lose your face. Love could handle anything. You know, the Bible says love could cover a multitude of sin. Sometimes people say love stupid and dumb. You could take anything when you love. Genuine love. But sometimes love gets too smart. And looking at faults and problems and so on and would not cover it. So Jesus is saying you lost your first love. I want you to go back to it. And we don't want to move in a downward spiral from what I call romance to the rut. And I want you to know this group of people, I'm going to show you in the text that we have, they lost it. And God had to say, return to me. I'm begging you, come back. You know why I come to Christ? I came to Christ because I had Tabanka. How many of you know, know what is Tabanka? Tabanka is a word in Trinidad is when somebody you love, you know, rejected your love, and you get heartbroken. How oh, you just call it in Jamaica, yeah? Oh, you have no name for that? You should have a name for that. I was heartbroken and love with a young lady. Not this one, you know. You mean, after the heart, heartbreaking, I got this one. And I thank God. Seriously. That is what drove me to church. I went to church one morning crying. I wanted a difference. My heart is broken. In love with this young lady, I want to get married to her. And then I'm heartbroken, sad. Nobody could help me. Life became meaningless and hopeless. And I went to church that morning. The Holy Spirit invited me. It was a church that my friends in high school went to, and I remembered. The Holy Spirit says, go to that church. And I went and I heard the sermon, Christ can make a difference in your life. I said, what? I want a difference. I lift up my hand that morning after the preacher preached and I was gloriously saved. 1970, in August, when I got up from my knee, I cried for about half an hour. This pastor, when you're preaching, I point on the finger to preach the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. It can transform the lives of people. It is powerful. People may laugh at it, scorn at it, but the gospel is able to transform church, pe preach the transformed gospel, the transforming gospel. 
And that's what the church is all about. When you preach the gospel, lives are transformed and lives continue to be transformed. And that's the first priority of the church. And when churches lose that, they're in serious trouble. So Jesus is actually saying to this church in the book of Malachi, I want to show this to you. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. And Malachi chapter 3, I gave it as a text, it's verse what? It's on your paper. Verse what? 7. Return to me, and I will return to you. God will only say to this group, return to him, because it left him. And they started well, but they left him, and he's, return, and he's asking them to return. Now, what I want to show you now, what happens when we lose it very quickly. What happens when we lose this, this love? And love, by the way, is very powerful. Let me tell you something about love, how very powerful. And I saw, I, when I went into Pastor Dwight in the office, I saw a very important scripture, which I call a final apologetic. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have loved one for another and never try to win people through an argument. Too many people are in theological arguments. Win them through your love. It's called a final apologetic. The whole summary of the Bible, a lawyer tried to corner Jesus. And when this lawyer tried to corner Jesus, tell me about the law. What, what, what is the law? What is the summary of the law? And Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, and your mind. That's the first and great commandment. It's the first, it's the priority and great commandment. And then you will love your neighbor as you love yourself. I think when you come to know Christ, you get to love yourself. You don't know yourself if you don't know Christ. When I came to know Christ, I realized that I'm important, chosen, ordained. I have value. You don't feel that way out in the world. People don't make you feel that way. You're a rag. You're from the lowest rung in society. But when you come to know Christ, and that's what the church should do to people, you have value. People matter to God. Jesus will leave a whole crowd and go and talk to one woman who was a prostitute by the well. One man who was ostracized by society. His name was Zacchaeus. Jesus would say, oh, everybody don't want to hang around you, they see you as a thief, a tax collector, but I want to go to your home to have tea. One individual. So the priority is to love God with all your heart and all your soul. That's the first and great commandment. He will teach you to love yourself and then you will love your neighbor because if you don't value yourself, I don't know how you will value your neighbor. But I've learned this past that why when you love God, he gives you capacity. Because sometimes the love of, sometimes human love runs out. Many times human love runs out. And in the book of Romans it says, tribulation, work at patience, patience, experience. Experience gives us hope and hope does not make us ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So when human love runs out, God places his love in our heart and that's what I mean when you are a husband and you run out of human love God puts his love in your heart you fill up your tank of love again because the Holy Spirit pours that love and he gives you capacity and I believe all of us we need capacity to show love whether it be for your wife whether it be for other people who are difficult people etc love is powerful that's why Jesus is saying, return to your love. I believe all these people are doing what they are doing, whether it's getting up here and in a very polished way making an announcement, they are filled with joy, they are serving and giving. It's all because that is driven by one thing, love. Don't lose it. The more you love God, the more he will put that capacity in your life. Now, when that is gone, let me show you how it affects your life. Are you there? When love is gone, and I will show you how the, one of the best counseling methods 
is a relationship with people that you have. People would not listen to you unless you relate well to them. As a matter of fact, love should be a foundation. Because Jesus showed us the example. He said, my father loved me before the foundation of the world. And we should have love as a foundation in all our relationship with your children. One pastor sat in my bedroom floor one time to tell me about his son who went off on drugs and he was crying in my bedroom. He's very close to me. And he says, Cecil, the only thing that brought back that boy is because he knew that I loved him. Love is a foundation. So that is that one thing that is driving all the wonderful characteristics of the transformed church. But when that is missing, here's what will happen. Respect goes. And I want to show you straight from the Bible because I'm a word preacher. Amen? Turn to the book of Malachi. You know the people, when they lost their love, their sacrificing became substandard. And I don't want to go through all the details. You know, Malachi chapter 1 and verse 8. And when you offer the blind a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it to your governor and would he please be pleased with you. When the people are, I'm going to show you from the word of God. When they rejected the love of God, they started to give God substandard sacrifice. They gave God the sawfoot lamb for offering. Offering is a big thing. Right? In the eyes of God, sometimes God watches when people give. Jesus watched people. Them rich people, what they give. The poor people, what they give. But I think it is not so much the amount, but the level of sacrifice. And here in Malachi chapter 1, when it was offering time, instead of giving God the best lamb, they gave him the sawfoot lamb. He said, why don't you take it to your governor? What we have in Jamaica? President? Prime Minister. Take it to your Prime Minister. See if you'll accept it. That's what God told him. So when love is lost, our sacrificing becomes substandard. Don't lose your love. Secondly, when love... And, and you know, when you have love, you will sacrifice and do anything. I love my children. I love my wife. I love the church. I sacrifice. It's hard work. It's hard work to pastor. It's hard work to pastor for 34 years. You have to have a lot of energy and passion. Nobody's going to follow somebody who is listless. Are you there? It loves, it's love that drives it, Richard. Secondly, when we lose our love, relationships are affected. You know, God went to church that morning and he's always there when we are worshiping. And here's what he's telling the men in Malachi chapter 2. Are you, are you following? The, are they putting it up there? Are you putting it up? Put it up for me, please. Verse 13. And here's what God's saying to, to worshipers. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears. If you see people come here and they're, you know, they're crying and they're weeping, you will say, well, that is genuine piety. It's a move of God. God says you're covering the altars with weeping and crying so he does not regard the offering anymore nor receive it with goodwill at your hand. And you say, for what reason? Because the Lord had been a witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she's your companion and the wife of your covenant. Why did he, did he not make them one having a remnant of the spirit and why one he seeks an offering offspring so take it to your spirit that none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth for the lord says that he hates putting away he hates the riff he hates the breaking up of the relationship god doesn't like, love it although he died oh god god jesus died to bring us back for he died for reconciliation if he did not die i couldn't come back to him our sins separated us from God. And Christ died for reconciliation. And what is happening here when he went to church that morning? He says to the men, I want you to stop crying. Why? They ask him, why God? 
Why are you not taking an offering or giving big this morning? Or giving bigger than anybody else in the church? And God says, no, keep your offering. He says, they, say, God, they ask God why. God says, I have been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. So that tells us that God is always watching how we are relating. That's why in the Bible it says, you know, if you go, you know, to church and you remember by the Holy Spirit that somebody offended you uh, and, and, you know, some offense, I want you to go and handle it first and then take your gift. Sometimes we take that lightly. We have all kinds of grievance in our heart and we hate this one and that one and we're giving big. And when God says, listen, uh, if you're giving, what should really predate your giving is your relating. And he says, man, I want you to keep your offering. People were probably surprised in church that morning. God said, I don't want offering. And God says, I don't want your offering because I'm watching you all. You're dealing with your wife. She is firstly the wife of your youth. The one to give you treasured memories. She is your companion. She's your good friend. And then she's the wife of your covenant. You sign the contract. I'm not castigating anybody who has a broken relationship, but I'm just telling you, God's standard. If you are married, stay married. By the grace of God, get capacity from him. Get strength from him. And God says, listen, the reason why these people, and my dear friends, you will, I will show you in the Bible what's the first thing God says in counseling. The first Thing, the foundation thing in counseling as he's dealing with his people. He says, I beg you return to me. Look at the kind of sacrifice you're making. I beg you return to me. Look how you're treating your wife. You're covering violence with your garment. You're an abuser. I watch in. Until the God says, yes, you're robbing me. Robbers. How come God? He says in tithes and an offering. Listen, I talked to my good friend yesterday. I have another good friend in Jamaica called um, Eric Hussin. Wow. I'd stay in his house any day before any five-star hotel. He's a good friend. When I tell you, a sound man. I told his wife, wow, you are blessed with a good man. And he's a good elder. This morning, before I came to church, he's out already going to church. And he's there and he's an executive. He's a big man in Jamaica. I asked him to come and preach in my church. He's a businessman. And come and share his testimony. Man, he went home, man. And he speaks from his heart. And he, man, he went home with patwa. And he started to talk of pick me and whatever in Jamaica. And people are trying to understand. But he's speaking from his heart. And he's an executive. She's the wife of your covenant. And why are you abusing? When love is in your heart, you don't abuse. And that's why God says to us, man, your wife, your wife's body is like yours. How are you going to damage your own body? I prefer to massage my wife. Are you there? And look at how she's smiling as she knows. Take care of your wife, buddy. And she's looking very good. You better thank God for a good husband. Watch me. So respect goes. They give, they give substandard sacrifice. Relationship is affected. Giving is also affected. I was going to tell you something about Ricky. And Ricky says, Pastor, I am blessed because I'm a tither. And I know that man is a giver. How he opens his home. He's, when he goes to the market, anything you want. When I came to Luke's wedding here, we came about 15 of us. He greeted us in the airport and he took us the great scotchies. Fish, pork, chicken. All the trinities were so happy. But he's so generous. He didn't let us pay for that. 
And listen, we're going beyond just giving tithes and offering. We're talking about a generous lifestyle. Everybody say a generous lifestyle. That's what God wants us to be. Give and it shall be given unto you. I don't know people talk. I'm a giver. I'm a, a tither. Tithing before I, when I got back, I went to the baptism class and they say you have to give tithes. And I started even before I got baptized. And, and I, my first salary was $180 per month. And when I'm giving $18, my father says, why are you giving the church so much money? And I respectfully disobeyed him. And up to today, I'm a tither and I'm not a pauper. I'm blessed. The church is blessed. I, I tell you, if you're a giving church, and you see, I heard about the power of one. Wow. You have it right on, Pastor. You're moving. You're moving. Challenge your people all the time, every time, every year like I did last year. We purchased real estate. I heard a term. Land banking. It's a good term. That's one of the ways you can save. And God says, I, I, I give you the Bible so that you can live here and there, abundantly here, eternally there. I gave you the Bible so you can multiply, but also to possess the land. Come on, let's be wise. I'll tell you one of the reasons why I like this church also. It's, it's a church that includes the corporate. Too many churches look at church only as a community. It's a community, it's a cause, but it's also a corporation. And Jesus, in case you don't know, Jesus said, I must be about my father's what? Now, the bottom line is not money. The bottom line is people. But we're very businesslike with people. And Paul says we must not be slothful in business, but we be fervent in spirit serving the Lord. That's why I like the passion in this church. We are the same way. Luke told me, Daddy, you will like this church. See, you like the worship. You like them. They're just like us. I feel at home. Come on, give God praise. I want to show you the marks when love gone. I'm saying that people hold back on their giving. If you have love, that's the motivation for giving. I heard the person who got up here to encourage you, the, uh, the intercessor. You give because you love. That's the ultimate motivation. Nobody should hold you by the scruff of the neck. No pastor is going to hold you by the scruff of the neck and say, give this morning. No, 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 no. We give because we love him. How many of you love Jesus? But something, when love is gone, what we say, um, respect goes, sacrificing is affected, relating is affected, giving is affected, but also living is affected. I want you to see something. Malachi chapter 3. You, you know people come to church and battle God? Yes, I'm going to show you in the Bible. People bad talk God and the work of God. Well, if you, you might feel comfortable saying they bad talk leaders and pastors. They bad talk other Christians. Some people, they have not been committed and they get sour in their Christian life and you know, hurt people, hurt people. So Malachi chapter 3, and I believe it's verse 13 says, Your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. You're talking harsh against me? And they say, Lord, how we about to talk you? You have said it is useless to serve God. And what profit it is that we have kept his ordinance. And have walked as mourners before the Lord. And you're calling those who are cursed blessed. It's like people say, well, it doesn't make no sense serving God. They're bad talking everything. They come into church, they're bad talking the pastor, they're bad talking the leaders, they're bad talking and them Christians and that way. It is vain to serve the Lord. It makes sense. Listen, if you're a Christian over 20 years and you remain the same, it's your fault or either the you and the church's fault that you're going to. If you come to our church and you hear the word of God, people are exposed to the word of God. But if they open their heart to what is said, and when you listen to your pastor, don't only listen to words, listen to his heart. Because pastors are there to be trendsetters and to go before the people and show them the way. 
I tell you, I travel with my good friend Michael. He's a true disciple. And God has taken Michael from a low place to a high place just as he did to me. A low place to a high place. If you are serving God, he's always taking you on an upward journey. And if you stay close to the anointing, God is going to bless you. Respect your leaders. Let me say one last thing before I move on. Are you there? Uh, are we going all right? I wouldn't be long again. Right? And you know, my heart is full. And I like to say plenty. But I must remember, you know, lunchtime is coming, right? <laughs> so in other words, their living became boring. You lose your love. Your sacrificing is affected. Your relationship affected. Your giving is affected. And life is a bore. How do we revive? How does God revive and resuscitate it? Very quickly. I want to show you something very powerful in counseling if you're a counselor. God knew all the people's faults, all their errors, all their mistakes. And you're counseling somebody who have lost it. They're not sacrificing. They're not giving. They're not relating properly. How are you going to start counseling them? And God shows us. What are the first words? No, you know, anytime people talk about Malachi, they feel the, the book of Malachi is about offerings. Well, I want to change your theology today. It is not about offerings. It, it includes offering, but that's not the main theme. If it was the main theme, God would have mentioned it first. But look what he says. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 2. Are you there? What it says. And you know you are so prophetic. This morning I heard you singing a song. I will build my life on your love. And you sang that? I heard that chorus. I will build my life on your love. I am a keen listener when I go to church. You know. I listen to what the spirit says. He who has ears to hear. Let him hear what the spirit says. Hallelujah. If you are enjoying this clap your hands. And here's what God says. I have loved you, says the Lord. And yet you say, where you love us? How come you love us? Show us how you love us. That is the language of insensitive people who have lost it. When a relationship reached that place, Huh? I pastor, I tried, I, I pastor a long time, I, I marry probably over a thousand people already, weddings, and try to counsel people in relationship, especially women, to go back. I counsel, go back to your husband and say, Pastor, why are you going back to? That's a big question. Do I go back to abuse? Listen, if you have a wife, take care of her. If you have some tips, she has something to come back to. Huh? You have no money, you have nothing. And you want you to come back? You have even love. And you want a woman to come back? So what I'm saying is, you have to have a foundation in the relationship. I'm talking seriously now. I'm talking about relationship, and this relationship could be also aligned with our relationship with God. That's the way some of us treat God. We are abusive. We don't give. We don't, we don't sacrifice. We are called to be light. You know, I was telling our church last, last week, I was preaching, and Jesus went to the church, and he, he and I, I would not have liked to be in church that morning when he was there, when he says, you, you, you buy vipers. Would you like to be called a snake in church? Jesus called people, you generation of vipers. No, they were playing, play acting, and God does not like that. So here is the first thing. If we have to resuscitate when we have drifted, here is the counsel that God gives. He says, I love you. And the song that you sang this morning is a prophetic song we can live on his love. Because the divine lover states his priority. 
God loves all of us this morning. And watch what he says. I have loved you, he's saying it historically. I love you in the past. I love you today. And I will love you tomorrow. I have loved you. I'm keeping it up. How many of you are glad that Jesus loves us? Listen. You know, sometimes they say we Caribbean people, you know, we don't like to express love. We don't like to say it. But God is saying it. I love you. Say it. Say it to the person next to you, I love you. Bruce, God for that boy. I love you. So watch me, watch me, watch me everybody. God doesn't only say it. God doesn't only say it historically. But God initiates it. I love you. In spite of. I know your weakness. I know you're sacrificing. I know you're treating your wife good. I know you're not giving. I know you're not relating. I know you're bored. I know you're saying all kinds of things about me. I have loved you. That's God. Come on, clap your hands. God is a good God. <laughs> Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing present or nothing to come, but we're not going to take advantage of that love. We are going to respond to that love when he says, return unto me. So he says it. He says it in spite of your weaknesses. He says it historically, and the God we serve initiates it. So that's the first measure of counsel. Secondly, I'm just going to share five things with you very quickly. The second way counsel. You know who the people who survived the indifference? You know are the people who had never lost it? You know are the people who really enjoyed their walk with God and walk with him for years? And still in love? And still smiling? Hey, let me tell you this. I have to tell you this little joke. I, I went to a class reunion, my high school reunion. And I went up, they have it every year, and they call up when we used to go to high school, 16, 17, 15 years old. So we go to it every year. I was alive while in school, so they invited me. Right? So we are talking now, and everybody talking about family and showing pictures and so on. I whip out my phone and I show my pretty wife. So, and they say, I said, this is my wife, man. Said, wow, call me boy, nice woman. So how long are you married? 40, 44 years now. One woman, my 44 years with one woman? That's how the fellas in the world responds. So what I'm saying here, we could love. God will pour forth his love in our hearts. We could be initiators of love. We can be filled with his love. He expects us to walk in love. But I want to show you the people who stayed and were able never to lose it. Lose it. Malachi 3 and verse 16. Very quickly. Then they, watch it. Then they, are you following everybody? Are you enjoying this? Okay. It's just a preacher from away, so he wanted to say so much. But in about five minutes again, we will, we will stop. Then they that feared the Lord speak often one to another. Everybody say community. Everybody say cluster. Everybody say life group. You have life groups here? Very important, Pastor. What we are doing here, all the three services came together. Large to celebrate. Small to care. So I want to encourage here yeah, a little plug for the life group. Don't you come on Sunday morning? Do your very best during the course of the week to get into a group of people who fear God. That's how we live. Bruce is my friend from Jamaica. Every time we meet, we're talking about the things of God. Richard is my friend. Michael is my friend. When we meet, it's the things of God. 
You know, Jesus had to say to Peter one time, when Peter says, don't go to the cross, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't uh, love or savor the things of God. You should love the things of God. So when we get together, we talk about the things of God. They that fear the Lord speak often. When you come together, what your conversation will be? How the children doing? You know, in, in, how are they doing? Are they doing well? Are they serving the Lord? How are they doing with their academics, etc.? We're praying for them, etc. That's our care for our children. So what I'm saying, watch me. When Jesus saw the multitude, he saw them scattered. Are you there? Scattered means that they didn't have a sense of community. So pastor, this is our role. To bring them together. And you're doing right. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often have I tried to gather you? As a hen does his chicks what you refuse. So the people who survived and the people who kept their love alive and they didn't lose it, they stuck together. That's why the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Three last things. The church in Laodicea, the last church, this is a church that says, in, in, in Revelation chapter 3, three, three very, a very important point is to keep our love alive. So in the book of Revelation, there is a church that reflects this age where people will say, I am rich, I don't need anything. I don't need Bruce, I don't need Richard. I have everything material. They're like a rich fool in the Bible. He has enough for now, and he has enough for the future. And God says, tonight, you're going to die. And he says, who those things are going to be for? And then God called him a rich fool. If you're rich, you're supposed to be wise. But if you're rich, you're not supposed to be a fool. Because he was living a one, listen, he was living a one-dimensional life. He was only living for the material. And that's the sin of this age. So in the book of Revelation, here is a church boasting. Huh? And they're saying, you know, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15, these things say the amen and faithful and true witness to the, in the beginning of creation of God. I know thy works. You are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I'm rich. I have become wealthy. I have need of nothing. I don't need anybody. I don't need people. I don't need money. I am all right. And some people reflect that attitude. But here, yeah, could you imagine people rich and God calling them poor? God says, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say you are rich, you have become wealthy, you have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched. You have money and you are wretched. I can testify. I don't want to keep you long, but I counsel millionaires who are wretched. This is no joke. You know, wife fighting fighting for the material. This is true. Wretched it was a lesson to me. I spoke to very wealthy people who want to restore relationship and they put a lot of money on the table before me. I've had all that experience. I've spoken to wealthy people who says, Pastor, I'm going to get you a new brand Volvo car. And I went, I bought a second hand car and took him for breakfast without saying anything. So rich, but the wretched, miserable. Could be rich and miserable. I want you to be rich and happy, eh? Poor! There are plenty money by the poor. Jesus calling them poor. Blind and naked. They're exposed. And here is a council. You see, what I see here is that they lost their pizzazz. They were lukewarm. 
They were not like the transformed church. They were not happy and singing and rejoicing and passionate. They lost their pizzazz. And Jesus is telling them how to get it back. And these are the two other very important points. Firstly, he says, I want you to get gold refined with the fire. In other words, I want you to get noble character. That's what is important. For all leaders, the most important thing is your credibility, integrity of heart, and skillfulness of hand. The most important thing in your life is your character, and your character can bring you money. You can go to, to the bank and get a character loan. A good name is better than riches. When you lost your character, you've lost it. So Jesus is saying, I want you to get me gold tried with a fire. Tried and proven character. And that will be recaptured. Love for God. It's only Jesus who can give you that kind of character. How many of you agree? Then he says to you, I want you to get white raiment. White raiment is your covering. I remember the song in the melodies of praise and all hymn. Clothing is righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. I dare not trust my own. I lean on Jesus alone. He is our righteousness. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you want to recapture your love, you have to come to a place of depending on me completely, relying on me. And lastly, if you want to recapture it, he says, I want you to anoint your eyes with eye salve. I want you to recapture vision. Vision is important. As long as you have a vision, a vision gets you back on track. A vision will wake you up in the morning. A vision will remind you of your goal and your dream. A vision provides morale. A vision attracts money. He says, I want you to get back that if you don't have a vision for your life, you're poor. If you're not dependent on Christ, I don't know. I'm dependent on him. I trust in him. I trust him to keep me. I trust him to give me character. I keep my eyes upon him. I look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. And I want to thank God I can stand as a testimony today. The most important thing for me is to finish well. I say to my son, I want you to live in such a way that you will not make me ashamed. And I want to live in such a way that I will not make you ashamed. And we can do that through Jesus Christ, our oh Lord. My transformed church, you have a great name. If you transform individuals, you will transform the church, transform the community, and you can transform Jamaica. God has started a work in you. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, you love him. Be passionate and protective of his love. God will take you to places that you did not dream of. I didn't show the church, but the project, the last project we, we had was a medical center, over 60 people. I forgot to mention a good friend here. It's probably the Holy Spirit, Alison Nicholson. Would you stand up, Dr. Nicholson? I was just talking about that reminder. This lady is an intercessor. She goes to CLF. Put your, come on, put your hands together. People matter to God. Amen. And she's an encourager. I believe she's a lecturer in UWE. Right? In medicine. But I never believed that we would have a medical center today. We employed about 60 people. About 15 to 20 doctors. I don't even know. I just give guidance and direction. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man. The things God has for us. But they are revealed. Hi again. I hope that today's message was an inspiration to you. I pray that you'd experience God's best in your life. If you made a first time decision for Jesus today, I encourage you to get involved in a local Bible believing church. Also, drop us a line at info at hetransforms.me and I'll send you our book, First Steps for the New Believer.
it is free of cost. Additionally, if you are in the Kingston and Metropolitan area, feel free to come and join us on Sundays. You can check our website for further details. God bless you real good.